Welcome into this Wednesday edition of Big Ten Today. So glad to have you here, and it is brought to you by Old National Bank. I'm Kylan Mills, and a lot to get to on this Wednesday. Softball and baseball seasons in full swing. Some women's lacrosse awards to touch on in just a bit. But we start with the NFL draft just over a day away in the Big Ten with a lot of prospects who are hoping to hear their names called and to see their dreams come true on Thursday evening or at some point throughout the weekend. A look at the last five drafts, 55 draft picks in 2023. The Big Ten faring pretty well last year. Now, Michigan was the team atop that list last season with nine draft picks. Ohio State and Penn State tied at six following that. But once again, Michigan with a couple of big name recruits. A lot of folks have their eye on this year in 2024. For more insight now on some of those Big Ten prospects getting ready for the big day, we welcome in Fox Sports College football reporter Bruce Feldman to the show on a very busy week. Thanks so much for making the time. Appreciate it. Oh, well, thanks for having me. All right, well, let's start out. I thought it was interesting. You wrote that you feel like, well, yes, there's a lot of hype surrounding the quarterback situation, that you're actually most intrigued by some of the wide receivers in this class. So let's start with Ohio State's Marvin Harrison Jr. Good route running, high IQ, but maybe not the number one pick, according to a lot of NFL scouts. Why is that? Yeah, it surprised me a little bit, to be honest, because I, I look at Marvin as the closest thing to a sure thing in this draft. I mean, he's the most complete of all the great receivers who come out of Ohio State. He's got really good size. He's really polished. He runs well, terrific hands, is physical, all the things you want. Um, when I talked to NFL receivers coaches in the last two weeks, and I said, is Marvin definitely the guy? And several of them said, no, for us, it's Malik Neighbors who's the number one guy. Um, they like Marvin. They just are wowed by Malik Neighbors' ability to separate his burst. It's just a, he, they think he is different and rare with the ball in his hands. But again, I, I think Marvin Harris Jr. will go to a lot of Pro Bowls and will be a great receiver because everything we've seen from the Ohio State pedigree, all these guys come in who are really good and they end up being really good in the NFL. This guy is even better. He's bigger. Um, he's more polished. I think he's going to be a great pro. All right. Well, let's move on to the quarterback class. The one player out of the Big Ten. Everyone's talking about Michigan quarterback J.J. McCarthy coming in, projected to go top 10. Where he will fall remains to be a question. Uh, but maybe not, you know, really wowing people with his athleticism and what you saw in the collegiate game. But his combine numbers were really good. What's the word right now and what the scouts are saying? Yeah, he's intriguing because he didn't – because of Michigan's system. And look, they were the best team in the country. He didn't have to throw it that, as much as any of these other guys. Um, in some games in the Big Ten, he was out of the game by, you know, the, the second drive of the, of the second half. So they weren't worried about padding stats or anything like that. Um, what people like about him, they think he's really football smart. They think he's a very good footwork. He's a really good athlete in terms of you could see it against Ohio State. You could see it when they really needed it, um, could extend plays, could take off and run on third down, throws really well on the run. I think he's a guy. Drake May also fits in this category from North Carolina. They're the some of the youngest guys in this first round QB crop. And I think there's some people who look at it and go, OK, maybe, you know, hopefully you don't have to throw him in the fire right away. Um, feel like you can continue to develop him. People like what they saw from his pro day and saw improvement in terms of um, uh, there's some, there's there's definitely some people who have a little bit of a hesitation on. They felt like almost every throw in college it's always looked like a rocket shot where maybe it was a, a, not exactly layering the ball in like they want to see from some quarterbacks. But you saw a lot of that at his pro day. So I think JJ can do a, almost ev everything you want and. The intangibles are really impressive. I think he's going to be a guy that a lot of people want to bring in and have because of his makeup, because of his athleticism. And you just feel like he's a guy who's going to be a leader and a winner. McCarthy, bringing in that 27-1 and record, one thing I wanted to ask you about is how much are scouts looking at that experience now and what they've been able to accomplish at the collegiate game? You look at a Brock Purdy from a couple of years ago, Mr. Irrelevant, able to translate to the NFL. How big of a factor is that? I think it is a big factor, especially you could look at and say, oh, if he went to the 49ers system that obviously Purdy is you now locked down, he looks like he'd be a really good fit. Um, he, he is way more athletic than I think a lot of people want to give him credit for. And in the Jim Harbaugh system, and I know this a few years back, they had a, a, a big 12 quarterback transfer in Alan Bowman, 
and Allen put up a ton of yards in the Big 12. And there's a lot of footwork that requ is required of quarterbacks in Jim Harbaugh's system. And a lot of that is a pro style stuff. JJ already has those things down. So um, even though he's really young relative to other quarterbacks, I think he is very accomplished and the whole thing about the adversity that that program went through and how they kept it on track and how he had a big role in that, I think that bodes very well for him at the next level. How about one of his targets? Wide receiver Roman Wilson projected to go maybe second, third round at this point. Yeah, he's small, but he's a player who does have the speed, has the explosiveness. Do you see him possibly being maybe a sleeper? He could be. I mean, he is really fast. Now, the, the knock on him is he's not he's not big. And so people look at him and go, you know, I think he's more of an outside receiver, even though you tend to see guys that frame sl slid inside. Um, but he is he is very explosive. And I think there's a lot of stuff in the right system. I think he's going to be a big play guy. It's just, you know, does he get to the right system? This is a loaded. Gr this is the best draft for receivers in a long time. So that could push him down. If he was in last year's draft, you know, with the players there, I think he would have been probably one of the first five guys taken at, among the receivers. This group is just way deeper and there's a lot of bigger guys. And there's some speed guys who are even faster than Roman. I mean, Xavier Worthy ran 4-2-1, and people see that on film, not just, uh, you know, at what he did at the combine. Well, a key piece in protecting the quarterback and making the entire offense go is the lineman. Penn State offensive lineman Olu Fashanu projected to go top 10, possibly even, maybe. Um, some good quarterbacks in this class and in, you know, some of these NFL teams. How big of a piece would he be, and how do you see his game translating to the NFL? Yeah, he's he's impressive physically. He's bright. He is a guy who still pretty young. I mean, I think the guy most teams I've talked to is rank as the top offensive lineman is Joe All from Notre Dame, who's even bigger and is probably a little more polished. But Olu is impressive, and I think the potential of him as a pass protector in the NFL. I would not be surprised if he's probably the second offensive lineman to go. I mean, this is a good crop of, of offensive linemen coming in. There's a bunch of guys who are very physical, who who might be better at guard than at tackle, that I think he's in the, you know, he's probably right after all, but I think he could be ahead of the other, the other guys, whether it's two guys who have played, you know, one from Oregon State, one from Washington, and then J.C. Latham at Alabama was a massive guy. Those guys might be seen as more guards than, than Olu is a, is, is a pure tackle, and I think there's going to be a lot of interest in him. I, I would not be surprised if he goes in the top 15. I, I think top 10 would surprise me, mm -hmm. but I could see top 15, top 20. Okay, how about Penn State edge Chop Robinson, another possible first rounder for the Nittany Lions. NFL Combine numbers really showed off that elite speed, athleticism, but I've seen a lot of people say he's maybe a high risk, high reward guy. Why is that and what's the talk around him? Pure speed rusher. Now he's not small. I mean, he's big, he's heavier than Dallas Turner. He's almost 255 pounds from Alabama and he is really really explosive great first step I think people want to see him add a little bad more to his game but he could be a designated pass rusher in this year and give somebody double digit sacks and that's impacting games on third down the question is how much more can he do um, I suspect he'll go somewhere in the first round because to be as fast as he is it's not like he's like 240 pounds he's almost 255 so I think people look at that and you see some of these Penn State guys, many of them who are these freak athletes, they, they back it up once they get to the combine. And whether it's a Micah Parsons, we've seen a lot of guys, especially Penn State defenders, who really flourished once they got to the NFL. All right, before we let you go here, Bruce, some big news coming in today that the Heisman Trust is going to reinstate Reggie Bush's 2005 Heisman Trophy. So this just announced on this Wednesday. What does that mean to him in the bigger picture of football? Yeah, I think you know, I worked with Reggie for a couple of years at Fox, and it was felt like it was only a matter of time. I'm actually surprised it took this long. When NIL first went through a few years back, Reggie and I had long talks about this. And one of the things he had told me was, he was like, look, because I said, I had told him, I had talked to some um, experts who are in the NIL space already. And they said, you know, if, if this had got, been in play when Reggie was in college, 
he would have made even before social media, you know, was it was a was a resource for on this run, two to three million dollars, which back then is a, it was, it was a ton of money, obviously. And Reggie said to me, look, he was like, I'm good with what happened to me, because for it to happen for for to me, it's like now all of a sudden, all these other maybe not all of a sudden, but all these other college kids who've come after me are now going to reap the benefits. And I'm fine with how that played out. Um, his, his situation was really complicated and messy. Um, but again, I think this was long overdue because, you know, back in the, in the day, there was a lot of stuff that went on that wasn't getting reported or, you know, the NCA didn't get near. In this case, you had some pretty agreed people in the NFL agent space who ended up, you know, kind of turning everything in and that blew up on him. And I think it's, you know, a lot of people feel like given the system the way it is now, it's probably long overdue that he's in. It seemed kind of like a farce because everybody saw the highlights and saw the amazing plays and was like, OK, this guy was the most outstanding player. And for that reason, I don't, I don't think, I think there's a lot of people who feel pretty good about what finally happened today. Really interesting that Reggie had that mindset, though, at the time that it happened, like, I'm OK with it happening to me if it paves the way for future players and makes it easier for the next generation. Uh, just goes to show the type of perspective that he has. Yeah. And look, I mean, he did he, he, he did get money at, at that point. He didn't get what he probably would have gotten if NIL was in place. But the whole situation was kind of screwy back then. And look, I think it's good that 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 the Heisman Trust finally stepped up. It, it, it probably had taken too long, though. All right, well, Bruce, thanks so much for stopping by. Appreciate the time. Hopefully you get some sleep, a big weekend ahead for you. Yeah, looking forward to this draft. Thank you. The Big Ten Conference announces 2024 women's lacrosse all-conference teams on Wednesday following a vote of the league's head coaches. That same group will also select the individual award recipients. That announcement to come next week. Among the 32 honorees, five were unanimous choices by the coaches. Michigan defender Maddie Burns, Northwestern attackers Izzy Skane and Madison Taylor, Penn State midfielder Kristen O'Neill and Rutgers midfielder Cassidy Spillis. Now, to see the full list, go on over to BigTen.org. Those, the unanimous selections, though, and congratulations to all of the athletes on fantastic and hard-fought seasons. But now we got to turn to the diamond, and for that, we welcome in our expert analyst, Michael Huff. Great to see you to talk about some of the baseball teams in the Big Ten that are trending up, some, unfortunately, trending down. How you doing, first of all, on this Wednesday? I am good. Very excited. Midweek. Looking forward to this coming weekend because there's going to be some big series, as always. As always, right? And it's the time of year where you want to be playing your best baseball. Let's start with Illinois, a team that was not picked to finish in the top six in this conference, leading the Big Ten right now, thanks in large part to their hot bats. Yeah. I mean, you look at them leading the Big Ten in slugging percentage and home runs with 71. How yeah. is it that they've been able to get that done? Well, 71 is, is kind of impressive. Knowing that 54 is the number two, that's hugely impressive. Yeah. Really, these guys started off, Dan Hartley always does a good job with their preseason, going against some nationally ranked teams, going on the road, and they got beaten up pretty good. But they found a way toward the end of that to start feeling good about themselves, and that challenge brought them into the Big Ten season with a lot of confidence that we've faced some really top flight pitchers. Now we know we're going to face a lot in the Big Ten, but maybe not quite as many. And all of a sudden they got some confidence when they started rolling and they have been on a roll. You think about 15 and one at home. Yep. As you mentioned earlier, they've won 15 of their last 16. This is a team that is definitely trending in the right way with their bats. That's what's carrying them. It's going to be very exciting coming weekend because they're going to face a tough Maryland club. Illinois winners of eight straight. However, my big question for you is, is yes. this sustainable? Because you look at hitting, it comes and goes. And that's why a lot of coaches and experts will tell you, you have to be good at two of the three things, offense, defense, and pitching, because if your hitting dries up, can you still win ball games? And Illinois at times has given up a lot of runs in some of these wins, just looking through some of their scores. I'm like 8-5, 14-10, a score yes. of a game that they won. Yep. Is this sustainable going into the postseason? Well, being drafted by the Dodgers and coming up within that organization, pitching and defense was always stressed more than hitting so yeah. to your point you've got to have two of the three that are clicking um, for them this is college you can get hot you can sustain it it's going to be tough to sustain it for the full season but maybe they've already had their hiccup early in the year and now from this middle point on the bats can carry them through well, maybe that's where you see some of those non-conference losses paying yeah. dividends you pointed out playing oh, yeah. tough teams for sure 
that helps, you know, that development later on, and now yep. they can carry this momentum into the postseason. All right, well, let's move on to another team that also is not picked to finish in the top six. Nope. I mean, it's very interesting the way the standings are right now, but we got to look at Purdue, tied for second in the Big Ten right now, swept Rutgers, MSU in their last two Big Ten series, so coming in playing really well. What's been the key? I think the key for them has been the pitching. Right now, they're sitting at number two in the Big Ten overall team ERA, which was something I wasn't really expecting. And for every coach, when you go into that season, you're hoping that your preseason workouts over the winter, you're going to have some young pitcher or some young hitter, maybe a veteran, a transfer, mm -hmm. that's going to step up and do more than you expect. They've had this incredible freshman swinging the bat for them all year when you talk about Gaffney. And then their pitching having been so solid, they are finding ways. Typically, Greg Goff has them playing small ball running a lot, putting a lot of pressure on teams, and they have found a way to win, especially as they've gotten into the Big Ten, which has gotten them in that number two spot right now, which is very exciting if you're a Purdue Boilermaker. One thing that's interesting about this Purdue's pitching staff, you mentioned great ERA, among the best in the conference, but they don't have a single individual pitcher who's top 13 in ERA in terms of their starters. How have they been able to get it done by committee and be so successful? Well, I think that bodes really well for the club. When you think about that, there isn't one guy I'm looking for on a Friday, a, a Brody Breck type person that everyone yep. knows could be a first round or right. top 10 pick. They don't have one of those. They don't have one of those. So they find a way to pick each other up. They find a way to have their pitchers keeping them in a game and I think they've done a really nice job of scoring not just early but then scoring middle and late in ball games and understanding that it's not just the first three innings and it's not just the middle three we have to put pressure on teams all nine and they've done a great job to this point of doing that another team you have trending up is Nebraska a team that started strong dropped a series to Rutgers has come back around good all around when you look at the three categories yep. like they don't have a clear weakness but no. what what is it that's led them to this point just as you said, you know, there is not a clear weakness. I think you should. She knows more about <laughs> baseball than I do. Um, the fact that Will Bolt has done such a good job challenging in the preseason, their losses against national ranked teams were by one or two runs. They won a few of those. So they clearly came in understanding that they have the talent. I thought when you lose your shortstop second baseman, Matthews Anderson, guys, 40-plus home runs combined between the two of them, yeah. there was going to be a big drop-off. And really, there has been none. They have had nine guys putting the bat on the ball. They have had multiple pitchers. Their, their saves are by committee. They have four different guys that are getting multiple saves. So Will Bolt is finding a way to make sure everyone feels a part of this team. Everyone understands they have a role to play. Everyone is playing that role, which is the reason that they got into the national rankings recently. Now, again, a Rutgers team, which we know has a lot of talent, took two out of three at Rutgers. But overall, I mean, Nebraska is earning this spot, and I like the way they're turning. I think it's been a great first half of the Big Ten. How about Brett Sears? Can we touch on oh, him really quick? Because yeah. their Friday night starter has just emerged kind of out of nowhere. If you look at his history in terms of his ERA, now one of the top in the Big Ten, what is it that's allowed him to have this type of success on the mound? I think it's that you never know when someone is going to say something to a pitcher. You never know when something, be it a grip, a pressure on a grip, mm -hmm. that something clicks, and then the confidence happens. And for yeah. Brett, he finally has that confidence. Here's a guy that had over a 12 ERA three years ago, almost a 6-2 years ago, a 5-2-8 last year, and now all of a sudden he has like a 1-3, one, 1-4 one, ERA, top in the Big Ten. Yep. There has been something that has clicked in terms of the release point, in terms of the the grip on the baseball and then the confidence that is spoken volumes and he has been that Friday star that you know if you're a Nebraska fan there's a guy going out there that you feel for sure you're taking one out of every three if not giving yourself a chance to sweep and then Sears being the number one guy when you don't expect him to be moves everyone else one down Back and down. suddenly yep. it's a very difficult thing to go up against this pitching staff another team that you have trending up is Iowa four wins in a row they're big time That's ace. why they're trending up. They yes. should have been trending up a long time ago. But just as you said, four wins in a row. All three of their starters have really done a great job of finding a way to pitch the way they're capable of pitching. Mm -hmm. All three got into the fifth inning this last weekend. Kate Obermuller got into the seventh. Brody Breck got into the eighth. And what I love was the fact that we saw three to one, four to one strikeouts over walk. We know all three of these pitchers, Morgan, Obermuller, and Brecht, were good enough, powerful enough to do some incredible things in the Big Ten this year. They have not been able to do that. Too many walks, not going deep into games. But we have four in a row and an incredible sweep last weekend, which puts me in that trending up kind of category.
I have to correct myself, five in a row actually for oh, right, Iowa, but still. The midweek win. Exactly. So the midweek win, if you add that into the mix. Um, I think it's interesting. You pointed out, Breck, first of all, I want to mention co Big Ten pitcher of the week, seven and two third innings, gave up just one hit, one earned run one during hit. that span, <laughs> yes. 12 strikeouts. So yep. he is really firing after dealing with a little bit of an oblique issue. And only three walks. Mm-hmm. And again, for Brody, for all three of these Iowa starters, there's been an issue with almost averaging a walk per inning. 12 to 3 ratio, outstanding. This Iowa team coming off a program record tying 44 wins with so much hype, you have to imagine maybe some of the expectations played a factor in how they performed early. Now can they carry this momentum into the postseason? Moving on, a team that you have trending down, Maryland. And this is where it's interesting looking at where they were projected to finish in the preseason poll and where they're at now losing their last three series. What's the story? Well, and again, trending down sounds negative. (laughs) What I have seen is a club that has so much talent. Mm -hmm. Again, preseason number three. I look at these guys. They have some good arms on the mound. Matt Swope is the perfect transition from Rob Vaughn. Playing at Maryland, loving Maryland, coaching at Maryland. Just a seamless transition. The bats are solid. They have multiple players that can hit. And somehow they just have found a way to stumble and not necessarily fall down, but they've stumbled sitting at six and nine in the Big Ten right now. I think for Maryland, there's still three to four weekends left. And where Maryland is kind of trending down compared to what I think their expectations should be, they're only two in the loss column from getting into the Big Ten tournament. And I think right now we're going to see a lot of teams trying to get their footing underneath them, but really not focusing so much on what's the overall record. Is there an NCAA at large? But more, how do I get these last two or three weeks getting right to get into the Big Ten tournament? Because if I can get into the Big Ten tournament, then I'm giving myself a chance. And Coach Swope has said specifically, we got to get the pitching staff together in order to do that. Moving on to Rutgers really quickly, really good across all categories, yes. but they're just three and nine in Big Ten play. Why is that? I, I, this <laughs> million is the million-dollar question right now. They are first in overall hitting. They are third in pitching. They are second in fielding. So as we talk about an Illinois club that may have one thing that looks outstanding, we're not too sure about the others, Rutgers on paper has all three. They have the number one player in the Big Ten right now, Josh Kuroda Grauer. They've got great arms with Justin Sinabali leaving all those guys. And for Steve Owen, I'm sure he is scratching his head. And I look at them as this is that team that when others play, this is that one benchmark. Can we beat these guys? Can we take two out of three? And I think they have seen everyone's A game where other teams like in Iowa, like in Indiana, may get a B game every now and then from another Big Ten component. (laughs) But I think right now, Steve, unfortunately, seeing everyone's A game and everyone is just taking advantage of a little thing here, a little thing there, and finding a way to beat Rutgers. All right, well, Michael, thank you for the expertise. We're going to check in with you in just a little bit to talk more about some of the players who maybe could compete at the next level. Continuing this theme we've got going on this edition of Big Ten Today, J.J. McCarthy coming off such a special season for a multitude of reasons. Now to share more insight on his path and how he got here along with a number of other Big Ten players, we welcome in 24-7 Sports Midwest football recruiting analyst Alan True. Alan, thanks so much for stopping by Big Ten today. Appreciate the time on such a busy week for you. Yeah, no problem at all, but it's almost done. Almost there. All right. Well, let's start out by talking about McCarthy. You've been watching him since eighth grade. He doesn't have video game like numbers coming out of that Michigan ground and pound offense, but certainly an incredible resume and what he's been able to accomplish. How has he been able to get to this point? How have you seen him develop from that eighth grade self? Yeah, back then uh, he was he looked like an eighth grader, maybe even younger. (laughs) But anytime the ball came out of his hand, it was immediately obvious the kind of arm talent he had, the athleticism that he had and then two years later as a sophomore he put up huge numbers at Nazareth Academy that was before he ended up transferring down to IMG but during that time he put in a lot of work you know, he worked uh, he played seven on seven with boom in addition to what he did at his high school he worked with a private quarterback coach and Greg Holcomb he was always and that's where he's got some of those viral videos of him you know throwing jump passes spinning in the air that kind of thing but beyond that he was always throwing the ball always working with his receivers always working with a quarterback coach and I think that is really what helped him hone his skills and then that move to IMG which is a tough move to make leaving your high school I think that also helped get him prepared for the next level 
Well, McCarthy expected to go top 10. It'll be very interesting to see exactly where he falls, possibly a top five pick coming out of the Big Ten. Let's move on to star defensive back for the Iowa Hawkeyes, Cooper DeGene, another player you've been watching for a very long time. Unfortunately, his career not ending exactly how he wanted it, suffering that lower leg injury, later saying it was a fibula that he broke. But what stands out when you watch him and his trajectory through the collegiate game? Yeah, when we first started to evaluate him in high school, it's interesting because he was so dominant in football and basketball, but he came from a smaller school. And I think it's a good example moving forward of it doesn't matter necessarily the size of high school that you have as long as you're better than the players they put in front of you. He was in every sport possible. He played quarterback, was just such an outstanding athlete. And then he was given a chance to play in the All-American Bowl, which is the best from around the country. And he proved himself very worthy then. And that's when he took a big jump up the ranking. So with Cooper, I think the, the lesson is multi-sport guy, always been super competitive, super successful in anything that he does, anything you ask him to do, quarterback, basketball, defensive back, Iowa asked him to return punts. And so when you have somebody who's just that athletically gifted, that story usually turns out pretty well. And it, it certainly has for him. Another star defensive player coming out of the Big Ten, Minnesota's Tyler Newbin, the program's all-time leader in interceptions with 13. You see the numbers on paper, but what's the scouting report on what he looked like coming out of high school? He's always been big. He always uh, was a physically put-together kid, even as a sophomore, junior in high school. He really put himself on the radar by going to some national camps. He went all the way down to San Antonio for the All-American Bowl camp, did really, really well down there came back to Illinois and did some local camps and put himself on the radar. Back then, the question was, is he going to be a corner? Is he going to be more of a safety? Most schools thought he would grow into a safety, which is what he has done for Minnesota. But another one who was always obviously in the weight room, but also going to camps and proving himself. Coming from St. Charles North, which is a really good high school program, but not one that at the time was getting necessarily tons and tons of uh, Big Ten type prospects coming through. He went out to other events and, and made sure that his name was known, and that certainly turned out for him. How about Penn State tight end Theo Johnson, 12 career touchdown receptions. Interestingly, coming out of Windsor, Ontario. Just curious, how did he get on your radar coming out of Canada? Yeah, he's one of the few prospects that I've had to get my passport card out for. <laughs> okay. So I had to get over to Windsor, which was a fun trip. But he actually came this way as well. He came all the way over to Grand Rapids, Michigan for a camp at Grand Valley State. And at the time, nobody knew who he was. You know, this 6'5 kid walks through the door that nobody knew. And that was a, a satellite camp that had a lot of uh, Big Ten and other Power Four or Power Five at the time coaches at it. And that's when he really made a name for himself. Then his team came stateside. I remember them playing a couple of teams in the Detroit area. That helped him. But he was another one that knew, hey, a lot of schools aren't going to come to Windsor to see me at first, at least. I need to go two places to do that. So he did that. Eventually, uh, we all needed to figure out where Windsor was or how to get to his high school. But prior to that, he certainly put in the miles to be able to put his name on the radar. All right, well, glad you got that passport all squared away and you found your way to Windsor and were able to get the recruit and scout on him. All right, let's move along to Ohio State lineman Michael Hall, 54th overall player coming out of high school, but missed a majority of his senior season dealing with a broken hand. How did that impact his recruiting trail? You know, it only impacted it so much because he was a household name by that point. But when he started to hit the camp circuit prior to his junior season, uh, he wasn't a known quantity, and he was traveling, I believe, with raw talent at the time, an organization that's had a number of top prospects over the years, and they took him to a couple camps. He went to Kentucky and Michigan State uh, and had no offers at the time. Both Kentucky and Michigan State offered him that summer. That was when I first saw him was at Michigan State, and it was pretty obvious then that he was going to be a blue-chip prospect. After that junior year is when he jumped way up into the national rankings. So by the time that injury happened and he missed a good portion of that senior year. I, I believe he was even committed to Ohio State by that time, but certainly already had a bunch of offers, was ranked nationally, so it ended up not affecting him. All right, well, good to hear. He's ready to move on. Now, Wisconsin running back Braylon Allen, a two-time All-Big Ten selection, four-star recruit out of high school, but not necessarily at running back. What's the story there? Yeah, he played safety uh, in addition to running back and then started to get so big, you can see even um, back in high school, he was a weight room guy, always been really strong, big. And the thought was just that he might outgrow a running back and be a linebacker. And then uh, he ended up reclassifying, graduating early, 
entering Wisconsin as a 17 year old, but really looked like a 20 plus year old by that point. But the majority of those in the evaluation business thought that he would play defense and Wisconsin gave him a chance to play running back. That was a, a big part of him choosing them in addition to being an in-state guy. And so he, he obviously proved that he could do that. But for a long time, he was viewed as a safety, strong safety, but possibly a linebacker recruit. A lot of changes just in general in the recruiting process with NIL, the transfer portal. Now the Big Ten adding four West Coast schools, including some big names, USC, UCLA, Washington, and Oregon. And Washington coming off a great season. How do those schools being added to the mix impact what the recruiting landscape looks like? Yeah, I think it just makes the obviously widens the net that all these schools can cast you saw usc come out this way and recruit a number of kids from michigan in the midwest at the end of last cycle uh, picked up a kid from minnesota which you don't see very often you see the schools here michigan and michigan state recruiting out west much more michigan state now with jonathan smith that certainly has opened up the coast and they're going all the way out to hawaii for recruits so i think recruiting is getting less regional doesn't mean you don't take care of your own backyard and your immediate footprint but i think you see every school now able to recruit a little bit further outside of their normal territory because of the way recruiting was heading and then now with conference expansion that certainly made it a lot easier for them to, to recruit kids uh, further away from home Okay, so have the frequent flyer miles ready. Maybe not the passport, but the miles ready, right? I have them all ready now. I won't, I won't get caught sleeping again. So passport cards ready, Delta Sky miles are ready. I'm ready to travel. Okay, there we go. Well, Alan, thanks so much for joining us. Once again, Alan True with 24-7 Sports. Appreciate the time. Yep, thank you. Welcome back into our Chicago studios here for Big Ten Today. And Michael Huff is back to answer all things. So I gave you quite the tease before coming into this block. He knows everything. But we're going to dive into which Big Ten players have potential at the next level. And we got to start with the big one. Yes. Iowa junior right handy Brody Brecht has yeah. been watched for a number of years. I mean, his fastball tops out at over 100, yep. maybe not consistently. But what else is it that scouts like about his game? His slider. He's got yeah, a nasty so he's got a whole, yeah, he's, he's kind of has a whole package. Um, here's a young man that projects preseason in the top ten, uh, potential top five. We've seen a little bit of a struggle this year. Last weekend, incredible. Went into the eighth inning, 12 strikeouts, only three walks. I believe everyone has been hoping to see that for the first ten ga nine games he started, not just the tenth game he started. But Brody sits at the top of it right now in the Big Ten, 84 strikeouts, number one. Only 48 innings pitched. Again, that is the one thing I think everyone feels like with his body makeup, he can go more, but he just hasn't. Fourth in opponent's batting average at 194. Yeah, he's number one on the list that pro scouts are looking at right now in the Big Ten. Are there any questions about what he can do at this point? Something I saw was maybe can he throw more strikes? What's his profile like as a starter? Are those still up in the air based on how he's played in this 2024 season? For sure, but you know what? There's a lot of teams that are saying right now, we can fix that one okay. little thing. He's got all the tools. He's got the frame. He's going to be a starter for somebody. Okay, another Iowa pitcher who's catching some attention is the lefty, Cade Obermuller. Yeah. His dad, West, an MLB pitcher, so he's got the bloodline. What's the scouting report on his stuff? Well, three-quarter arm slot, but he can bring it into the upper 90s. So projectability, it's right there. Electric stuff when he is on. But like Brody Breck this year, like Marcus Morgan this year for Iowa, has not been able to be consistent in the strike zone. Way too many walks per innings pitched. He also only has pitched in 48 innings over 10 starts. So simple math, that's less than five innings to start. These guys need to get up to where they can get to that sixth, seventh, eighth innings. And last weekend they did it. But this electric lefty, he is also very high. Top 50 for sure, top three rounds. He could have projected into the second, but we'll see what happens as the season winds down. It'll also be interesting to see how this Iowa team plays and if they can figure it out. Because you look at two big arms like that leading yes. off on Friday and Saturday, you'd think this is going to be a very difficult team to face in some postseason weekend series yes. since these two really seem to have figured it out. Now let's move on to some offensive players. we yes. gotta break, we got to break it down with the bats. Rutgers shortstop Josh Kuroda Grauer having a career year. Just career had his year. 200th career yes. hit actually the other day. One of the best contact hitters in the league. What is it that could allow him to elevate to that next level now? I think the consistency. 
and it's not just consistency with the bat. It's always consistent when you're hitting over 400, almost sure. 450. He's at 440 right now. But the fact that he is third in the Big Ten in assists at shortstop, he's only made four errors over the course of the year. He is second in the Big Ten right now in stolen bases. So you combine the fact that the offensive numbers are there, leading the Big Ten in hits, leading in batting average, got second in the Big Ten with 17 doubles. Here's a guy that is fielding the ball incredibly well in the middle of that lineup for Rutgers every day, giving them a chance every time they go out there to have someone getting some RBIs, getting some hits. So he's someone on the pro level that everyone is projecting. If not necessarily at short, definitely something up the middle. And worst case, he's a guy you could throw out in center field because he is so athletic. How about one last guy, Illinois junior catcher, Camden Janik, a surprising one that you put on the list, I maybe a little Camden bit. There. Yeah, so I, mean, I want to know why. Well, everyone loves catchers, all right? Okay. And, and, and this year, there's a good catching group, but Camden has stepped out, uh, stood out in front of me. When I look at the scouting report on this guy, everybody that I talked to said, here's a baller. Here's a guy that understands the game. Might be a little bit undersized, but for the most part, he knows exactly what he's doing. Constant contact hitter, gap to gap. What I love... Top 10 batting average right now. Sitting at a cool 362, 18 walks to only eight strikeouts. That's two to one, better than two to one walks to strikeouts, which is something we just don't see these days. I love that, and which is one of the reasons I know the scouts are looking at him as well. Janik also with a decent exchange rate, pretty clean exchange, yes. quick yep. release. So that yes. also bodes well for him behind the dish uh, additionally. So a couple players to keep an eye on through this final stretch of the season. And speaking of, Michael's back. He's not done yet. He's going to break down how these Big Ten teams can approach the month of May and a little softball talk to boot. How about Nebraska bouncing back in a big way with a pair of huge walk-off wins last night over Iowa and Lincoln? That's how it ended in Game 2. Ava Bredwell rocketed that no-doubter out to left field in the bottom of the seventh to give the Huskers the comeback victory, a two-run walk-off bomb. It also was a 1-0 finish in the eighth with a walk-off in Game 1 of that doubleheader. A look at the latest Big Ten softball standings. Northwestern still holding on to that top spot in the Big Ten. Michigan continuing their their hot play. They swept Nebraska last weekend and then the Huskers though responding so they're now right there neck and neck with Penn State in third. Here's our own Sammy Netling on what we're looking for down the stretch of the season. I've got my eye on two massive series this weekend for our number one and our number two seeds. We'll start out with our number one seed. The defending Big Ten champion Northwestern Wildcats will head to Lincoln to face what can be a potent Husker offense at times. The biggest question for me in this series is how does this Husker lineup plan an attack against the changeup of Ashley Miller in the circle for the Wildcats. Miller has one of the best off-speed pitches, not just in the conference, but in the country in the way that she deploys it, when she deploys it, and her consistency. How do the Huskers respond and try to attack that pitch in particular? And on the flip side, in the circle for, for the Huskers is Kaylin Kinney, what has turned to be their definitive ace this year. How can she limit the free passes and the extra base hits, especially at the top of this potent Wildcat offense? Now, there is going to be no bigger Husker fans this weekend than our number two seed, the Michigan Wolverines. The Wolverines are one game back from the Wildcats right now, and they will head to State College to face what is another one of the best hurlers in the conference in Bridget Nemeth. Now, the Wolverines have one of the best offenses, the best in conference play looking across Big Ten teams. And they have relied steadily on their four freshmen at the bottom of the lineup to add balance and consistency there in the order. Now, the question for me is in the circle for the Wolverines. How do their two aces, Durkowski and Hain, who we've seen struggle with control a little bit over the past few weeks, can they limit the free passes and the extra base hits against an offense that can be very steady moving station to station and knows how to manufacture runs for the Nittany Lions? This is turning out to be an exciting finish to the end of the regular season for Big Ten softball. All right, thank you, Sammy. Exciting baseball also to come in the month of May. Yes. That time of year, the weather starts to warm up, at least we hope fans are in the yes. stands. What are you looking for down this stretch? 
I'm looking to see how all of these players now start to react with more and more people into the stands. Students are now able to come out. It, weather's getting better. They're going to take afternoons off to get a little bit of sun. And when you start to fill up these stadiums up here in the north, it gets a lot more exciting when you're the home team. Most of the players at this point kind of know where they're fitting. They kind of know what little things they need to work on. There's no more big changes. There has to be a few little tweaks. And I really think everyone on the playing side is thinking about the Big Ten tournament. Mm -hmm. There is really no more talk about NCAA at large. Everyone is thinking, how do we get ourselves in a position pitching-wise, fielding-wise, hitting-wise, that we're playing the type of baseball we want to going into the Big Ten tournament. Now, there may be some tweaks, and again, coaches, pitching staff may move people from a Friday to a Saturday or Saturday to a Sunday, but for the most part, players are getting excited looking at the Big Ten and, and trying to get everything clicking at the right time. Talent a big factor, also experience a big factor this time of year as close games can often be decided on who has been there before. A lot to be excited about though with the final stretch of the Big Ten regular season coming in baseball. That'll do it for this edition of Big Ten Today. For Michael Huff, I'm Kylan Mills. Thanks for hanging with us. We'll see you next time. Take care.